Now, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to bring up, and I'll, I'll use the board for this, is what I call the causal chain of breathing. Now, this is a very, very simplified schematic view of things. The control of respiration is extremely complicated, and you need to go to school for a lot of years to learn enough about it. And we still, there's still things we don't understand. You know, and it's, it's, so this is, these are just the, the, the key highlights of this causal chain. So, as we mentioned earlier, the, um, the, the, the depth and pace of breathing in its autonomic, in its physiological sense of control, comes from the levels of carbon dioxide that are present in the system. And there's, there are receptors uh, which uh, live in the brain and also in some of the um, blood vessels, the, the carotid and the aortic bodies are two key ones. Uh, so the CO2 receptors in the system are constantly monitoring the level of carbon dioxide in your blood. When it reaches a certain threshold, okay, it triggers a signal to the phrenic nerve. Okay, that's the impulse to inhale. If you just exhale and wait, which we've done a few times already, what is it that's actually happening in your system that gives you that urge to inhale? That's this. The CO2 is building up, and it's, you know, the, it's hitting that threshold, and that the alarms are going, it's like, we need oxygen, we need to breathe, how do we do that? We're going to send an electrical impulse down the front of the curve, because that's what operates the diaphragm. Now, you can suppress that for a while. You can seize voluntary control over this mechanism up to a point, obviously, up to a point. Okay? And that, those suppression signals come from a lot of different parts of the brain. All right? But this is the basic sort of autonomic function we're talking about here. So when that signal goes from the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm, it contracts. Now, why am I listing these even as separate things? Well, my reasoning is anywhere along any of these arrows I'm going to draw, something can happen that gets in the way. Okay? There are things that can you know, prevent the diaphragm from responding to the phrenic nerve and so on. So we're listening to this, I'm listening to them separate steps for that reason. For example, some people would say, well, why do you list the diaphragm contracting as being distinct from the thoracic volume increasing? Well, there are things that can you know, prevent the, th the thoracic structure or musculature from responding to the contraction of the diaphragm, which is going to inhibit the ability of it to change its shape. But let's just say the diaphragm contracting, what it does, the mechanical effect of the diaphragm contracting is to increase thoracic volume, right? Actually, Instead of increase, I'll just draw the arrow, because I've used arrows in your handout. So it increases thoracic volume. Now, volume and pressure, as we may remember from high school physics, are inversely related. As volume goes up, pressure goes down. Why are these listed separately? Well, we, we do that all the time in yoga. You know, If you exhale, and then don't let any air in, right? You're increasing thoracic volume, all right? And the pressure is lowering, but here's another arrow, okay? The air comes, the air comes in usually, but you can prevent it from coming in by blocking the valve. Air come, I'll just say air comes in. As we've discussed, it's being forced in by the weight of the air that we live inside of. The, the air is literally being pushed into your body by the atmosphere. So now if we take this all in the reverse direction, the diaphragm relaxes. And this is a key point here. This, this is an action, OK? This is a muscle being sent a message from a nerve to contract, just like any other muscle is being asked to operate in the body. But here, that is simply a cessation of that signal. The brilliance of the design is that another set of muscles doesn't have to kick in to get the air out. 
that would be way too complicated, and there'd be so much potential for get that getting screwed up. It's really good. It's like with the gas pedal, you know? You push down to make the engine spin faster, and what do you do to make it spin slower? You just stop pushing, and it springs back up. In the same way, the body springs into an exhale because of the elastic tissues that are being stretched uh, during the inhale. Okay? In fact, there are stretch receptors in the lung tissue. If you stretch the lung tissue too much, your body's going to say, hey, enough already. And what's it going to do? <laughs> it's going to shut down the diaphragm. It's going to say, OK, stop. And it's going to push you into an exhale. So you know, we're, we're, we're kind of hardwired, in, in the sense, for an exhale. You know, you don't, nothing has to happen muscularly to get the air out. This is assuming the lung tissue is healthy. Sadly, there are some diseases that compromise the integrity of, of this elastic recoil. Emphysema is the most uh, uh, common one. Uh, and air gets trapped in the lungs. And then these people, are, they suffer. Because that, there, there you're, you're in a double whammy. Okay, you're not getting as much oxygen on each breath because the alveolar structure has been compromised. So there's not as much surface area during the exchange. Plus, you lost the elasticity, which means you have to engage energy <clears throat> to get the air out. So you're burning more energy in the process of breathing, but getting less for your effort. And it's, it's a really diminishing returns thing that people with this disease have. So any of you out there that are still smoking, stop. Please. Okay. Tobacco. <laughs> All right. I know we have some subscribers in California. So. All right. So, thoracic volume. Don't want to have a negative effect on the economy there. They're in trouble already, right? OK. So when the diaphragm relaxes, the thoracic volume decreases. Thoracic pressure increases and the air goes out and the cycle starts again. I mean, vastly simplified, but the, the important thing about this is that some of the, the questions that arose, sorry, I wrinkled your hand out. Okay. So, some of the questions that arose were worded in such a way that um, there seemed to be a, a confusion about what's causing what. Um, isn't it, for one way to ask this, isn't it the expanding lungs, lungs that makes the chest bigger? Right? And this shows you clearly that's not, that's not the case. It's the increase in volume of the thoracic cavity that gets the lungs to expand, not the other way around. 